Okay, welcome back to part two. So the first image here is you can see how well this is all tied together, this image. So we have a print dress and the predominant color here is pink and green. The belt is a green and the bag. Look at the bag. It's perfectly tied in with the belt and perfectly tied in with the green. So you have this agreement all throughout this photo. And we'll come back here and look at the disagreement. This is what I was trying to get at. So this is a very summer uh, image, right? Summer type of image. It's popping. You have this bright, vivid red. And then you have these kind of muted brown frame lenses. Or not lenses, the frames rather. And there's just all kinds of disagreement here, right? That the fashion editor missed. Okay, I can remove this now. And then look at the agreement. So you have extreme agreement. And then you have this disagreement, okay? As a photographer, or even as a fashion editor, that's the stuff you have to look for because that type of disagreement will kill an image, and it did. You see that red dress in those frames did not, did not agree. Okay, this is cool. I love this image up here because I'm getting back. For some reason, this issue had a couple of these shots, this Jessica Rabbit. Do you remember who framed Roger Rabbit? Jessica Rabbit had... Her, she wore her hair exactly like this, covering her, I think it was her right eye. But dig it, right? So she had red lipstick, red hair. But look at the agreement here, how professionally done her makeup is. And instead of red, you have this golden bronze, almost like this bronze copper, right? You have this, right? There's this theme running throughout all these images, uh, like a, of a bronze or a copper and a gold, this kind of hybrid running through these images. Right, and all this is just agreeing perfectly well with each other. Okay, this is a cool image here. Again, we talk about agreement. So I want you to look at this image. And this is a good post-processing job too here. Because look at the burn. So you could talk about dodging and burning. So the, the Photoshop technician did a mild burn here on this jawline. So there's a transition from shadow to light. And what it, the, the, the tech did to bridge this extreme, they just came in here with a burn tool and put a, 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 a mild burn on this jawline. And it's really working. And the, so the agreement I was talking about, you have this red lipstick, you have a red hat. She's wearing some type of skull cap or a bandana or something. So that's red. And then she has like red a red uh, eyeshadow. And then she has like a bronzer here on the cheekbone. It's not a rouge because rouge would be applied a little bit lower, but you put a bronzer up here, right? And this, all this is in agreement. All these reds and bronzes, right? They're all agreeing. Even the burn is, is like this, this overall brownish red is what the photographer and the makeup artist, everybody was going for, and it works. Wow, look at the agreement in that photo. It's a tremendous photo, absolutely home run. Did a great job on it. Okay, this here, I love this choice of uh, wardrobe because what does that look like? It would look like to me, and again, we're, we're open to disagree. If you disagree, that's fine. But it looks almost like a female matador. You can imagine a bull ring in Spain. And this is the female matador who would come out in these, these beautiful tights, you know, well, with these ornaments. And you've got this kind of like a, right, this highly adorned shoe. Right, and you can just picture that being a matador, but the, the problem is, is look at the decor, right? I, I would have just probably, if it would have been me, I would have shot this outdoors in an actual bull ring in Spain, having the model in this same clothing, right? But just shoot it in a bull ring, and she's fully in the waist, le waist length, like a bolero, and she's got that hat on, you know, the hat, the traditional, like a matador hat. Oh my God, this could have been a spectacular shot if they would have gone all out, right, and did it the right way. Because it, look, it's shot indoors on this furniture, and this whole matador theme is being lost on this interior, right, and especially with this furniture. Just, there's disagreement here. Okay, now this is really cool. I wanted to really spend some time with this. Now, if you notice, I did a, an episode maybe a couple years ago, and it was on Cartier, and it was it looked like it was heavily... There was a mix of Lenny Riefenstahl, but it was like a Nazi. There was a na lot of Nazi symbolism. But here, I'm going to show you this. And as soon as I saw this image here, 
I knew it was Camilla Ockrens, right? It was Camilla. This is a this is Camilla Ockrens all day. So as soon as I saw it, I knew it was her. And sure enough, her name is down here. So you know, photographers. Annie Leibovitz has a has a signature look. Camilla Ockrens has a certain look. Stephen Mizell has a certain uh, signature to his photograph. So certain photographers have their signature look, and this is Camilla Ockrens. Okay. But my point is, you can, I'm going to show you these images, and they're all Olympian from, and again, there's, these images are heavily influenced. It's almost like Camilla Ockrens is doing an homage to Lenny Riefenstahl, but there's zero Nazi imagery in here. So that's the distinction I want to make between this and the Cartier uh, jewelry ad, ads, plural, is that this is Riefenstahl, like a Riefenstahl homage. But the, it has nothing to do with Nazi, the Nazi party. So I want to make that distinction very clear. So this, would, again, would be like Riefenstahl's work on Olympia, right? This is all going to be Olympia. Now, this would be her, This would be a Riefenstahl, but this wouldn't. Because this is some, it could be like a pole vault or whatever. But this, this suit is much too modern. And this is not a regal pose. This pose is kind of jacked a little bit. So this would definitely not be a Riefenstahl. This would be a Riefenstahl. So let's continue. Now look at this image on the left. Holy mackerel! That is Riefenstahl all day long. Look at the look at the parallelism here between this bar and the arms. It's a regal pose. Wow! Holy mackerel! Riefenstahl. Now these these are not because the the swimsuit is not it's too modern, and this is not a regal pose. This is kind of regal, but it's in color. Right, so this one, these two kind of missed the mark, but this one for sure. And again, there's nothing Nazi in here, nothing Nazi at all. And then this one here is kind of beautiful. She's got the traditional, it's all white, high-waisted, right, two-piece. But that would be somewhat, right, it's the, the, the arc. This is not kind of a, it's a little bit too arced to be really a reef and stall, but you can kind of see a reef and stall influence there. Continuing on, this is too modern, and the pose isn't regal. This pose is not regal, and it's far too modern here with this. Okay, this this would so the whole Riefenstahl was 30s, 1930s. So this is too modern to be 30s, and this of course is far too modern. So these would definitely not be Riefenstahl-esque images. Okay, here I like the geometry here. You got this, right? You've got this straight thing coming here in this arc, and then the shape of the arms here. So you got some geometry going on in there. It's really quite beautiful. And this is a cool image too, but again, it's not reef installed because it's too modern, these back straps, right? And the way the hair is done, it's too modern. But you saw a couple, so let's go back to the two, just for giggles. Let's go back to the two that were surely reef installed inspired. It's this one. And this one so those two and especially this one of all of them this is the granddaddy of them all right again because of the plainness oh excuse me the plainness of the shot right it's a two-piece but look at that oh my god that's just a home run home run okay so that was Lenny Riefenstahl inspired no Nazi no Nazi symbolism at all this is a cool shot the photographer is way low wide angle lens shooting up and everything about this is working and I want you to see the earring choice here because this is quick. so right here the model's wearing circular like a maybe ellipse but it's round my point is these are round but come over here to this image and you have a right you have something rectangular the earrings are rectangular you have this on the sleeve it's kind of a box a square or maybe a rectangle so there's agreement throughout this photo the only thing that's not agreeing is the belt buckle but i can give them a pass on that but it would have been really cool if that belt buckle would have been rectangular they would have really pulled that off but i mean still what i mean is when you do your homework right and this is again fashion editors when they accessorize a model right how am I going to accessorize the model okay I have the wardrobe now how am I going to fit it out so you even have the watch see this is what I'm talking about they put a uh, they put her in a wristwatch that had a rectangular face instead of a round face so rectangular 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 
and again this is the only one that's right that's out of uh, out of the the theme but it's okay it's a wonderful image and here we're getting back to Kenneth Willard so this is like uh, what I was trying to explain earlier is the photographer I was thinking was Irving Penn Irving Penn kind of originated this macro photography on the eyes and on the mouth. The pen especially was the mouth. But we're getting into modern times now, and these three photographers, Kenneth Willard is one, and the other two, they not only do the mouth, but they do the eyes. Okay, so this is, and I wanted to show you this. Is, I want to spend some time on this image because this is really critical. So Willard here, it looks like he's using this boutique lens. Now let me, let me talk about these apertures. So it, like we know a consumer level lens, the maximum aperture of a consumer lens is f1.8 okay it's not going to get faster than that for consumer level glass you go to pro glass pro glass starts at f1.4 okay so you can have f1.4 and more expensive and the glass gets bigger and it gets cleaner the actual quality of the glass is cleaner and it's larger in size like I'm talking about diameter of the lens the lower the number the, the bigger the actual glass element becomes so like a 1.8 might be like this 1.4 is bigger, 1.2 is bigger, and this is a boutique F09, 0 0.95. So these are hard to find, but it looks to me, because look, look, here's what I'm trying to say. So Willard came in real close for the shot. Now look, he missed focus. So this is what the danger, the danger of using an F0.95 a maximum aperture lens is that if you move just a hair, if you move a hair, you will blow your focus. You will miss your focus. And that's what happened to Willard. It seems to me he wasn't even using a 1.2 for the shot. He was using the F0.95, this massive hunk of glass where you're, right, you can get, like, right, your your uh, depth of focus is just a razor. Like a ra and you have to be careful when you use that lens because what happened, either he moved or the model moved, and what happened is he grabbed the eyebrow. The, now, you know the distance between an eyebrow and the actual eye. I don't know how, how much it is, but it's not much on a human face, right? The, of course, this is further out. The eyebrow, this part of the skull, protrudes further toward the lens, and the eye is set back further, okay? And the distance is minimal. But you can see what happened here with this lens. He accidentally caught focus on the eyebrow instead of the eye. Now the eye is blurry and out of focus and this even more so because right the model has her held her head is tilted right she's turning her face and with this monster boutique lens this was intentionally supposed to be out of focus and what he was supposed to supposed to do was grab this eye. This eye was supposed to be in focus and then blow this out, miss focus on the eyebrow but he did the opposite. As I said, I don't know how many shots he took from this. Usually, if you're trying to get a shot like this, you're probably going to take 30 to 50 images, right? Then when you're done, you go through and you examine all your shots to see which is the best one, right? You always take multiple, multiple shots. But my point is, when he used this lens, he missed focus in every single shot because that lens, that depth of focus is so narrow that if he took this photo 50 times to try to get it right, he missed all 50 times because of that 0 0.95 aperture. So the, the moral of the story, what I'm trying to, when you use an f1.2 or an f0.95 maximum aperture, you have to be so careful. If you're shooting wide open, just the slightest shift in either your hold or a model shifting results in this. Now this made this made it to publication. This should have never gone to print. It should it should have been discarded because the focus was blown. He missed focus here and got focus on the eyebrow. But again, you know what they probably said? Hey, forget it. Let's just run it. Let's just go with it. And I'm sure Willard was probably not happy with the results of this image. I'm sure he was not. Okay, again, this isn't this is what I was talking about with Irving Penn. Now this is gorgeous. I want you to see what they've done here, and it's really beautiful. Again, this is Irving Penn inspired, an homage to him. Now there's no liner, there's no lip liner, but look at the, this golden, copper, bronze. Whatever. It's kind of like a hybrid between a gold and a copper and a bronze. But look what the, the makeup artist has done. There's no liner until you get about right here. Then you can see they've applied a, a gold, copper, bronze, whatever lip liner. And it disappears right about here. So you can see that's the only part of the lip 
that has a lip liner and then the rest there's no liner now look how look how great that was just from a makeup artist applying that little bit of liner to match the nail color absolutely fantastic these are the little things I always talk about these are the little things that make the difference between a museum level right Hall of Fame shot and just and, and an average shot that that little bit of lip liner has turned this image into a Hall of Fame image it's the little things friends it's the little things okay this is cool this photographer again we're going back to Mariano Vivanco and the theme here is black white and red okay black white red now this is Gigi Hadid again right with this dog and you can tell this beautiful foyer in this building right it almost looks like a 1920s art deco like the, like when this was built you can almost being you can almost envision this being built in the 20s right here this with this design this probably is it probably goes back to the 20s right so they use this dog in here so you have the black and white and then you have Gigi in this red and this red lipstick so, right so you're getting back to this black white and red and it works even the choice of lettering here the choice of colors in the lettering going with black white and red and you have this agreement you have text you have an image and the, the theme is black white and red and god that's just gorgeous. look at that layout so everybody involved with this was really doing his or her homework and they made this into a fantastic fantastic layout my goodness now that's this is what professionalism this is professional okay we're getting back to the cover shot Okay, the mod 1960s London. And this one too. Now see, this is what I was talking about with an exacto knife. There's no font anywhere on this image. Okay, there's no font. This is now this is a really super gorgeous image. This is okay over here, but this is really awesome. Again, we're getting back to the black, white, and red. You take an exacto knife, you score, you cut this, you put that on a frame and put that on your wall. That is worthy to actually literally cut out of this magazine put it on your wall and this is cool here I just love this now I want you to okay now this is what I'm talking about a photographer taking multiple shots to try to get the image okay not an image but the image so the photographer here I want you to see the the lines the lines of this image so look at here look look here <laughs> I said look here. I can't believe it. I haven't said that since I was a kid so look here and you see the parallelism, right, between these, the arm and the leg. They're almost truly parallel. Okay, and then you come over here and look at the line going down through her leg and up into her arm, right? You can see this line. Okay, so what the photographer was trying to do, and what he was really trying to get, and he couldn't get it, he was trying to get, I, I'm positive of this, he was trying to get the leg, the arm, and from the elbow to the wrist, on the same plane but he missed right because this I'm sure this ballet dancer she probably did 100 takes of this image at least I'm serious she probably did this 100 times and the photographer tried he went through all the images at the end and this is the closest he could come but it's still a fantastic image but I'll bet I because I know as a photographer he just oh if I could have just gotten that arm right if I could have just gotten that part from the wrist to the elbow to be on the same plane as this arm and this leg, right? You would have had full agreement. Full agreement, and you have agreement here, right? So I'm sure he's kicking. To this day, he's probably kicking. Four years later, he's probably still thinking about this model and this image. And if I could have just gotten that forearm, you know? So, and this is another thing I wanted to point out. So... And many of these, now this is not an advertisement, this is an editorial. So my point is, you'll see a lot of these magazines, what they'll do is they'll run, when they initially launch a campaign, they'll launch it like this. They want the full image, right, so that you can fully appreciate the space. This image works because, look, you have this, right, this sweeping motion of the curtains here, and you have the sweeping motion this way. So they work in harmony, right? Now, as the campaign goes on months later, they'll, in the name of saving money, they omit the accompanying page. So if the, say if this would have been an advertiser for a shoe company, for example, right? The first month, they go with both pages. In subsequent months, they'll delete this page. Now, I want you to look at this. Let me get a napkin here. 
I want you to, I want to get a napkin to show you the difference. What this, what a difference it makes when you delete this negative space from an image. So here's a, so now look at the difference here. So again, if this were an advertiser, they delete this page and they only run this page. Okay, you see how the photograph it really doesn't work, even though you got the geometry, the geometry's here. But look, look how you need this negative space, space to really pull this image in, right? So that's why, again, this is an editorial, it's a one-off, but you'll see this all the time from advertisers, and they kill, they kill the, they kill the shot. Okay, so this was a two-parter, this one's 20 minutes, and again, I miss Glenda Bailey. You know what's weird? I'm going to get political here for a second, not in terms of political parties, but Anna Wintour from Vogue, she lost her way years ago, okay? She became a kingmaker. That's what Anna Wintour is. She's not an editor, not in the slightest. She is a kingmaker, or some people that call them rainmakers. She determines who succeeds in the, the fashion industry, right? Photographers, it's all ne nepotism, right? It's the, all the photographers now, the models, these, these people have made it only by the good graces of Anna Wintour. She's like the, like the mafia of the fashion industry, right? She's, again, I'm repeating myself, but she decides on her own who makes it and who doesn't. She has that much power because she took control of Vogue in 88. So this is like 34 years now she's been around. In over 34 years, she's amassed a lot of power. So my, my point is, Vogue has been off the tracks for a long time right Anna Wintour needed to go a long time ago but yet she's still there Glenda Bailey had this magazine for 19 years from 01 to 2020 she did a marvelous job at this magazine she should still I don't know the politics behind it I don't know why she was whether she just decided to retire or she was fired I really don't know the inside machinations of how all that happened but it's a, it's a crime that Glenda Bailey is gone from this magazine and Anna Wintour is still had her post at Condé Nast in Vogue. It's the crime of the century. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate you staying with me.